also if I can say from our point of view of our vantage, proffering the pictures obviously of the kitchen, it was our theory that those two potentially were attempting to actually assist in getting the deceased away from there. Um, our thought was that if you listen to Mr. if you heard about Mr. Seaborn, the senior's testimony, or not testimony, but his interview with the officers, those two dogs were distantly located away from there. And as you've heard from Mr. Sifuentes and Ms. Banks, it there is really the dominant animal in the household, the dominant dog in the family. And so it's not outside the realm of possibility that these two dogs try to assist or help in that there was the ultimate aggressor. You know, if you look at the pictures of the kitchen, there is portions that have do have one tile where it could be very possible that these two dogs were attempting to potentially pull her away or try to figure out what was going on while the vicious attack was occurring. So it's our position that there was the aggressor and that these two animals were limited, you know, were limited in their contact. The other point I would raise very briefly is in the initial subsection A and B of Chapter 5, subsection 22, even if these dogs did bite the deceased, if those bites were not the bites that led to the death, and they were superficial, such as the ones that were identified in the autopsy report in the extremities, then it is permissible under the code that these two dogs can be deemed dangerous but allowed to live. And so that even if there was the isolated incident, as you mentioned, where potentially these two dogs bit first or last, but they weren't the ones that caused the, you know, the, the injuries that resulted in death, the two incidents can almost be isolated. And so that's why I, we believe that it's a fair middle ground, whereas based on the evidence and the fact that the burden wasn't reached on these two dogs, that they would be deemed dangerous based on the first subsection, but obviously having the burden then reached on the American Bulldog, that obviously the applicable subsection two would be applied to him. How I would respond to your question, and, and I, I'd like to address some of these issues in, in my closing statement. I don't want to be too lengthy in response to your particular and specific question, but in response to your question, I would say this. Uh, the, the reference to there being no blood on the animal comes from this particular witness. I don't know that that's true. We were not at the scene. Um, the police report reflects that there were bloody paw prints all over the floor. So I'm skeptical that there were, was no blood on the on the other dog. Um, but at the end of the day, um, the, a lot of things could happen. The dogs could have licked themselves as they are want to do. That's what the police report indicates that one of the dogs was licking the victim. The dogs could have licked themselves clean of some of the blood. I proffer that, frankly, whether or not the dog had blood on them at the scene of the incident is really irrelevant because what we have is clear expert documentation that the dogs participated in the attack. And the only thing I want to say now that I'm going to include in my closing remarks is the, the repeated references to superficial wounds is really mis, misrepresenting what the autopsy report says. There are certain wounds in the autopsy report that are referred to as superficial indeed. There are many wounds that are not referred to as superficial. There are puncture wounds in the, in the autopsy report deep enough to expose the underlying fatty tissue, and the photographs reflect that. You know, half an inch, an inch deep puncture marks. Those are not superficial. And the cause of death on the autopsy report clearly reads dog bites to the head, neck, and extremities. That is all concluded in the cause of death. So I, I think this focus on whether or not the animals had observable blood on them all at the time is really a distraction from the clear evidence which shows us that all three dogs were, were clearly involved in a severe injury and or death to an individual. And officer, if I could just quickly respond. The only, my only concern about this is the state or the county is charged with reaching a certain burden, preponderance of the evidence. And there are multiple steps that have come out today that they, they didn't complete, they didn't finish. And, and simply burying their head in the sand and saying, well, we don't know what the result of this was because we didn't do it, such as the DNA, such as the fecal. You know, to say that that evidence is irrelevant because they didn't do it, it, it it's, almost, it's almost, I want to say, insulting to this, this tribunal. I mean, you took that DNA for a reason. You took the fecal samples for a reason. And now to say, well, we didn't need it, it you're just burying your head. 
and, and, it, it's, and it goes hand in hand with now saying, well, these, these marks, these ones are identified as superficial, but these aren't. We went through one by one, and these were all extremities. I never said that all of the bite marks were superficial. I just said that the ones that are identified as having been um, committed by the Rhodesian Ridgeback and the German Shepherd were identified as superficial. That was the autopsy report that was proffered by the county. Those were the pictures that were proffered by the county. These weren't my words or my findings. Okay. This was the evidence that they put forth before this tribunal. In fact, the only evidence that's ever truly been positive before this tribunal regarding the serious injuries has been by the respondent himself, where he has come before this tribunal and said, listen, uh, this is the dog that did it. This is the dog that had blood on him. This is the dog that was licking. Those facts weren't brought out by the county. They were brought out by the respondent. And so to sit here and say that we're trying to distract you is insulting again to the tribunal. It's insulting because if they were being forefront, they would have brought out all the evidence they had. Instead, they tried to make the whole picture about the three dogs, put them all into one, and then when we started talking about the specific evidence, that's when they told you, well, that's a distraction. If one plus one plus one equals three, and looking at one and looking at one and looking at one is a distraction, then we should never get into any specific questions at all. We should just take the state and the county's word that the bigger picture is for the better of the good. I don't know if we should be warming up or see with my closing statement. Or I, I have no further questions, so I'm ready for a closing statement. But I will make this. Tommy, you have not entered into evidence the autopsy report at this point. You do not have a copy. You still have it? I'm sorry. You still, I think you still have it. No, it's the police report. You took the staff that he's got back. Did you put them in Dangerous 
if they cause severe injury or well, any injury, but um, to, a, to a domestic animal or to a person. Um, more specifically, you heard reference to a part of 5 22 that talks about that, that the um, owner has to take responsibility for an animal that causes severe injury or death. And I think that's really important because then you put a lot of testimony from the other side on this case that we can, the county cannot prove, uh, you know, we cannot establish with any certainty which of the dogs caused the death. And that may be so. Um, um, you know, unfortunately, unfortunately, we're not charged with that responsibility. We do not have to establish which of these three dogs caused the death. What we do have to establish and what we have established is that all three dogs caused severe injury or death to Ms. Regatta. And um, I think that that's abundantly clear from the records that we have produced. Um, the, again, the reference to superficial wounds, if you take some time to look through the autopsy report, there are sections referencing injuries to the upper extremities and injuries to the lower extremities. These sections are lengthy. They're multiple paragraphs. And they talk about dozens of separate wounds. A handful of these wounds may be referred to superficial, but I would proffer to you that the bulk of them are not referred to as superficial, and if you read them, they're actually quite severe. Again, the wounds are deep, they're long, and the photographs, you know, are better, are, are perhaps even better indication than the words of how severe the bites are. As, as appalling and, and graphic and upsetting as the as the photographs of the neck and the head of this victim are. Frankly, the wounds to the extremities are sufficient to meet the requirements of the code. These dogs, even if they had not inflicted the injury to the, the head and the neck, would be it would be sufficient to say that they inflicted severe injury to a human based on, based on the, the extremities alone. Um, And, and just to go into the, the evidence that we've provided, this was a very comprehensive investigation. This was an investigation where the body was examined by a medical examiner, an extensive report was generated, extensive photographs of the condition of the victim were taken. An odontologist, a specialist in the bite marks, was retained. Uh, molds were made of the dog's mouth. Uh, he performed a second examination of the body in order to ascertain whether the, all three dogs had participated in the attack. And proper to you, the testimony that Dr. Silvers gave, in addition to the memo that he provided, shows unequivocally that all three dogs participated in the attack. The bite marks are on this, this woman's body. You can see from the photographs provided by that exam the, the bite marks that they were involved in. Um, they, clearly the injuries inflicted by these dogs were severe. So based on the testimony and the evidence that you've heard today, including expert testimony, the county has conclusively determined two things. One, that Ms. Regatta died of bites to her head, neck, and extremities. And you only have to look at the cover page of the autopsy to know that. And two, that all three dogs participated in that attack and caused severe injury to Ms. Regatta and ultimately death. Um, it's a terrible case. It's a shocking case. It's a case that is so severe that I think it's really the epitome of a situation where euthanasia is, is required. I think it would be irresponsible if the department didn't euthanize these animals after this vicious of an attack. Um, it, it, it just merely would be shocking to allow these animals to go on and risk the possibility that something like this could happen again. It's so severe. It's so graphic. Um, and in addition, it, in order to enforce the provisions of this code, the county has expended a significant amount of cost in caring for these animals. And I want to reiterate that the department is also seeking reimbursement for those costs, which are quite significant, for having to house these animals for a very lengthy amount of time pending this hearing. I believe the total was $4,900. Is that right? I know you've 
you have the document in front of you, so you know, uh, forgive me if I'm off. But $4,940. Pursuant to um, Section 5-2G, the county would also request not only that the hearing examiner uphold the decision to designate all three dogs as dangerous under 5-22 um, to support the decision to the discretion of the department to euthanize these animals pursuant to their dangerousness and also to grant the county to fees the cost that it's seeking for that the housing, feeding, and caring of these animals in the amount of $4,940. Officer, Dane County Municipal Code 5-22 has two subsections pertaining to the treatment of dangerous animals. And there's two subsections for two reasons. There are incidents that require euthanasia and there are incidents that require safety mechanisms, registration, fines, certain medical procedures such as you know, sterilizations and things of that nature. The code was established in this manner because depending on the level of the dog's involvement in the attack or the severity of the dog's bite, they should be treated one of two ways. And officer, we're not here today saying that the American Bird Dog should be spared. My client is here before you today saying, use the two subsections in the way that the legislature intended. And Going back to the state's closing remarks, this, the county has the burden. They have the burden the whole way through. So for the county, again, to say that they don't have to prove something, again, is the county burying their head. And when the county goes and says that they conducted an extensive investigation, again, is insulting to this tribunal. And I say that because when you get down into the specifications of the actual investigation, there was a lot of things that weren't done. Yes, a medical examiner was hired. Yes, a dental and orthodontist was hired. Yes, pictures were taken. But we have to get into the nitty gritty. And the nitty gritty is the bite, the bite reports. When the investigator says, well, only one dog was identifying the bite, that was there. But don't worry, had I had the information now, I would have made those reports. But yet, up until today, those reports still don't exist. We come into the fact that the police department's own reports, as well as I believe the autopsy report, says that fecal samples and DNA swabs were taken. Obviously, at some point or at some juncture, the county believed that that information may be necessary, may be prudent, and may be important. But they didn't act on that. Then comes the extensive dental investigation, where yes, we have pictures, and I don't mean to make this sound elementary, but what we have are pictures of molds being lined up to point marks. We don't have an extensive autopsy report. We have a Gmail message. Three lines that says medical degree of reasonable certainty. There's no report that identifies how this point and this point became a right mark. There was no testimony as to how, if it was a cluster of five or six, how they identify as one plus one equals one bite mark and one plus one, aside from the fact that the general measurements appear to be analogous. Meaning that they measured the dog's jaw, they measured the, the distance between the marks, and said that that automatically is a, is a match. In reality, though, there's another situation. In reality, is that if the dog, if one of the dogs has bitten them repeatedly, there is the potential that those marks are the same distance out of coincidence. But putting that all aside, you have to get back to what's important. And what's important is what the pictures show, what's important is what the testimony shows. And what the pictures show, and I mean this very respectfully, is it shows a scene. There's no way you can walk in this kitchen or be involved in this kitchen or be in this kitchen and not get blown These pictures are taken the next day. And the blood in the room is still in liquid form. It has it all dried up. That tells you just how much blood was in this scene. And when you look at that and you look at the comparison of these pictures, you see one dog that is two dogs that are absolutely spotless. These pictures are taken hours 
after the attack. Two, three hours, if that. You know, a person counsel says, well, maybe the dog cleaned itself. How does a dog clean itself under its chin? How does a dog clean itself in its neck? It's not physically possible. If these two animals were involved in the ambitious attack that took place in this room, they would look like him. That's the facts. That's what's been proven. If they were involved in that incident, they would look like him. My client came before you today, and he explained what he saw that night. While holding back tears, he explained to you that his dog of six or seven years is absolutely responsible for this incident. He admitted to this tribunal that he saw blood and DNA on that dog's body that night. He's admitted that that dog has shown some level of aggression before in his past, and he's not defending <coughs> that dog. What he's asking is that this tribunal take into consideration the two subsections and apply them according to the legislative intent. The legislative intent was the severity meets the punishment. There, the American Bulldog caused the death of this woman. The subsection that is applicable is euthanasia. Jack and Marley may have caused superficial bite marks to the exterior chummies. Those bite marks, even if they were done in a vicious manner, are to be punished by subsection A. They would be punished as non-threatening, non-life, and non-death inducing bites. If we took the county's approach in this scenario, subsection A would never exist. Meaning that if a dog ever bit somebody superficially, it would be in the department's sole discretion to euthanize that dog, and Section A would never be applicable. The only other thing that I'll offer before this tribunal, and I feel that this is some of the, the most important information that the tribunal needs to take into consideration, and that's the letter from the son of the deceased. This man, first and foremost, God bless him, is the man who lost his mother. But he's also the person that came on scene first that day. He's the first person to see the animal's reactions. He's the first person to see the condition of his own mother. And what he told the police officers, and it went uncontested in this hearing, was that the American Bulldog was seen licking the face of the deceased, while the other two dogs were timidly found in the living room. That man took the three dogs and put them in the room. That man called his son. And that man wrote a letter, because he can't be here today, agreeing with what his son is asking for. When you read that letter, this man asked for the two dogs to be returned, who he still sees as companions, who he still sees as viable, living creatures that deserve to live, albeit under safety mechanisms and regulations, of any individual in this room, of any individual in this world right now. This man sits in the best position to say what should happen to those dogs. Because he's the one that has the best vantage point. He's the only one that has any more knowledge than every other one of us in this room. At this point, my client is not contesting the fees. He will willingly pay the voting fees of all three dogs. He's done that because he wants them to live. My client is willingly Submitting to this tribunal that the American Bulldog needs to be euthanized under subset, the second subsection. But he's imploring, and he's asking that this tribunal see that the county has failed to reach its burden to require euthanasia of the other two dogs, and that the only burden they have reached is that those dogs are potentially dangerous and should be treated under the first subsection, which my client, again, is not contesting. Not that he feels that these dogs are dangerous. But as a responsible dog owner, as a responsible human, he is saying, deem them dangerous and they will live by those regulations for the rest of their lives. To openly acknowledge and understand that the county has failed to reach its burden in support of euthanasia. And so today I ask that you allow Jack and Marley to go home deemed as dangerous dogs to live under certain regulations and met safety mechanisms. My client will pay the fees that the county has improved. In and tragically, one animal will have to be euthanized. But I ask, the last thing I'll say is that you see that my client is caught in a rock and a hard spot. He's lost his great-grandmother, 
He's going to lose his dog of six or seven years. All this man really has left out of the whole picture is to have those two dogs come home and at least have some semblance of closure. So with that, I ask that you deem the two dangerous, but let them go home. Allow my client to pay the fees and euthanize the dog that was responsible for the actions that led to the death of the deceased. Okay, I'll give you the last word. Do you have anything else? Well, the only thing I would ask is to say that there is absolutely no evidence that suggests that the death of this woman was exclusively caused by the head wound or that it was exclusively caused by one specific dog. All I've heard presented today is speculation that the American Bulldog may have been the more aggressive of the three, but there's nothing in the autopsy or the examination by the odontologist that supports that information. What we have before us is information that all three dogs participated in the attack, participated in a severe injury, and that the cause of death to this woman was dog bites of the head, neck, and extremities. And so I think there's ample evidence. Frankly, the only safe thing to do, based on the evidence that has been presented, is the, is the determination that all three dogs are dangerous because that's exactly what the evidence shows. And that all three dogs be euthanized because they all three cause severe injury. And the suggestion that we can select one out as the one that caused more damage than the others, I mean, there's just no other. Okay, I've listened to all the evidence, and um, we'll move on the easy part, the ones that you all agree on first, that. Um, all three dogs are declared dangerous dogs that bear the euthanized. Now, the question as to Marley and Jack, um, given the severity of the injuries, looking at the different bite marks, the different reports, um, while they may not be the direct cause, they certainly were definitely participated in enough indirectly to definitely lead to Mrs to the decedent's death. I am finding in favor of the county, and I am declaring all three dogs um, to be euthanized. You do have the right to appeal my decision um, by filing an appeal within 30 days from today's date, um, and to get a copy of, of this um, recording. May I ask on the, on the issue of the, of the cost? Okay. And to, um, and to include in there the cost of $4,940. Okay. Plus $75 for this hearing. My apologies to you. I'm Thank you.